as we're going to go over this evening, why we have detailed creeds and confessions and why those are so important for the Christian church and the Christian people in this world. Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 14 is our scripture reading. This is God's word. Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some of the others of them should go to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. Therefore, being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and were bringing great joy to all the brethren. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees, who had believed, stood up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. And there had been much debate. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. All the people kept silent, and they were listening to Barnabas and Paul as they were relating what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they had stopped speaking, James answered, saying, Brethren, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. With this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, After these things I will return, and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen, and I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who makes these things known from long ago. Therefore it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles, but that we write to them that they should abstain from things contaminated by idols and from fornication and from what is strangled and from blood. For Moses from the ancient generations has in every city those who preach him since he has read in the synagogues every Sabbath. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray, please. Father, we bless your name and praise you for this time to be together. We thank you that Jesus indeed has been building his church uh, really since the time of, of Adam through Noah, through Abram, through Isaac, Jacob, David, the prophets, the Psalms, and now the New Testament. We bless your name that you have given teachers and pastors, shepherds to the church that have helped it, that have studied your word with great diligence and have been guides to the people of God on what it means, and we pray that you would help us not to be so prideful, not to be so unspeakably arrogant as to think that we ought not to learn from the many, many, many victories that the truth of God has had over error in the past, many of which are long forgotten by your church, but we pray you would help us to see the value of the great creeds and the great confessions of faith that your people have published over the years, not to compete with Scripture, but to demonstrate what the Scripture says and teaches and has always said and taught over against those who have denied it. And we pray that you'd bless us now this evening to that end. In Jesus' name, amen. First, by way of introduction, why do we have a confession of faith? That was brand new to me. Uh, coming out of evangelical fundamentalism, we had a a little doctrinal statement that was about 10 bullet points long, and it fit on half a page of paper. And then discovering the Reformation, you, you come to these doctrinal statements that are very detailed and very long. And I remember reading through the Westminster Larger Catechism. It took several days uh, of devoted study to get through that, that giant catechism and looking at the Heidelberg Catechism and the Belgian Confession and the Canons of Dort and 
There are many other uh, great creeds and confessions that came out of the Reformation. There are many creeds, there are many confessions that were written in the early church, and creeds and confessions written in the Middle Ages. Why, why are these things so important? One of the worst ways that anyone could ever study church history, aside from not studying it at all, at all, as many don't, sadly, would be to study it in a cold or detached fashion. Just to hear the hallowed stories of the courage of Athanasius of Alexandria and his bold stance against seemingly impossible odds for the full deity of Jesus Christ, it's enough to inspire us. Many historians have made the statement that the Western church, indeed Christianity, was saved from becoming just another form of paganism by a very brave and very biblical 22-year-old. Athanasius was 22 when he first stood up and said to the Arians, that's not what the scriptures teach. Jesus is God. He is not similar to God. He is not like God. He is God. He is one of three divine persons. And there's a great statue of Athanasius that's him holding the Bible close to his chest, and it says in Latin, Athanasius contramundum, which means Athanasius against the world. Because at times it seemed like he was all by himself. In the 60 years following the First Nicene Council, he had to fight and fight and fight. He was five times exiled from his church, persecuted. At one point, 5,000 Roman soldiers coming in the front door and him running out the back. We remember the tear-stained face of Augustine in that garden, where he finally repented. And we can't help but identify with his great struggle to let go of sin and the relief and the joy that he found in the Savior's warm embrace. It's the same with the study of the great creeds and the great confessions of the faith. God's word is absolutely sufficient. It is absolutely clear, as the Westminster Confession itself says. It says in chapter 1.7, not only the learned, but the unlearned in a due use of ordinary means, may attain unto a sufficient understanding of the Bible. Scripture alone, that solo scriptura, that Latin phrase, it was a great battle cry of the Reformation. And the reason it was a battle cry is because it was being attacked by the Roman religion. When people professed, professing to follow Christ and love the truth tried to elevate tradition, and the, quote, teaching magisterium of the church, end quote, to the same level, to the same authority as Scripture, the Christian people, the church, responded to that by, number one, refuting that idea from Scripture itself. The Bible itself does not acknowledge any other sources of divine revelation, any other sources of God talking to his people. And secondly, they published confessions which condemned such a practice of adding anything to the word of God written. The Westminster Confession, chapter 1.6, says, quote, The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life, is either expressly set down in Scripture, or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture, unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelations of the Spirit or traditions of men, end quote. And we could add to that, the Lord led me, the Lord told me, God said this, God said that. If you say that, if you say the Lord spoke, the Lord said this, the Lord said that, what comes out of your mouth next had better be something in the Bible. Otherwise, it's not God talking. Think about the deity of Christ, another great controversy that the church went through, the, the full deity of Christ and the triune nature of God. The Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is God in the fullest sense and the fullest meaning of that word. He is not similar to God. He is not subordinate to God. He is God. And this precious and foundational truth has been confused. It's been attacked. It's been denied by every kind of false teacher imaginable from the first century forward. In fact, the first seven centuries of church history after the apostles died were almost completely devoted to refuting false teaching about the person of Christ and the doctrine of God. Now, if you want to see kind of a panorama shot, just kind of summarized in one chapter of a book, I would encourage you to get Keith Matheson's book, Postmillennialism and Eschatology of Victory. And he goes over in the opening chapter, in the introduction to that book, the great doctrinal controversies that occupied Christians at different centuries in history. And what was being fought at the time. And those, those controversies are so important. 
They're so important. The issue of the doctrine of God, hugely important. The issue of scripture plus tradition and where is God spoken, hugely important issues. The issues of grace, how are we saved? The Augustinian Pelagian controversy in the 400s and the 500s and the 600s way back then. And that debate continued through the Middle Ages and, and really culminates in the Reformation. Those great debates. And then you have the debates over the authority of Scripture. And you have the debates over creationism that have happened in our time. And really, eschatology has been a, a focus of Christian study, really only really focused in the past 100 years or so. Would it be wise or foolish to take a careful look at those debates? To consider caref carefully and closely what Christians, what the godliest and best teachers that Jesus raised up for his church, what they said about those false doctrines and what they said about what the Bible says. Would it be wise or foolish to do that? It would be wise, of course. It's exceedingly wise to look carefully at those creeds at their theological works, at their expositions of Scripture. And it would be extremely foolish and extremely arrogant to ignore them. You see, the thing is, every person in this room, whether they, they like to use the phrase, no creed but Christ, no book but the Bible, everyone has a creed. And if you've ever heard someone say, no creed but Christ, you need to, to, to tell them that is a creed itself. It's just a really short one. No creed but Christ. No book but the Bible. A creed is inescapable. The word creed is simply comes from the Latin word credo, which means I believe. And when we discuss our beliefs over coffee, and when someone says, no book but the Bible, I don't get into that systematic theology stuff, I, no creed but Christ, and you start talking about the Bible, what do you believe about God, what do you believe about man, what do you believe about sin, grace, heaven, hell, the cross, Jesus, all of a sudden the person becomes a theologian with a creed. If you say, I believe, followed by anything about Jesus, grace, man, God, Christ, seven, hell, that's your creed. That's your theology. You have a theology. It'll either be consistent and biblical or inconsistent and unbiblical. Everyone has a creed. Everyone has theology. The question is not whether or not we'll have a creed, but whether our creed will be any good, whether it'll be biblical, accurate, and whether it will reflect the theological victories that our dear Christian forefathers fought and won or not. Whether it will reflect the fact that we believe Jesus has been building his church in the world for 2,000 years. The value of precision in creeds and confessions, is, I can't tell you how important that is. That, that's one of the things that makes them so valuable is the precision that they illustrate for us. Now, I want to tell you an illustration about myself. Growing up in a fundamentalist Christian church, I was taught the basics. I did understand the gospel. By the grace of God, he impressed that upon me. My parents had emphasized that enough. I remember youth leaders, I remember pastors saying, not by works lest anyone should boast. You can't be saved by anything that you do. I did understand that. However, if you had pulled me aside and asked me to write down on a piece of paper what is the doctrine of the Trinity, you would probably have received an ancient heresy. The first time I was ever challenged to define what I really believed about the nature of God, I was 18 years old. I was listening to a Walter Martin tape on Mormonism. I was an undergrad at Ohio University, and I was driving around town in my 1972 American Motors Hornet. <clears throat> and there were LDS missionaries everywhere. Mormonism is very big in Ohio, very big in Ohio. And they're all over the place on Ohio University's campus. And so I wanted to understand Mormonism, and I was listening to Walter Martin lecture on Mormonism. My dad had all these Walter Martin tapes. I used to listen to him all the time. And Walter Martin had taught theology in uh, a Bible college for many years. And for class, uh, for one of his classes on the Bible and on theology, the first day of class, he would tell his students, everybody, clear your desk, get out a blank sheet of paper, define for me the doctrine of the Trinity. And they would write down what they thought the Trinity was, and they would turn those in, and then they'd go on to the lecture, and he would take all those pieces of paper home and Martin said this, quote, I got more heresy than Carter had liver pills. I had never seen so many fouled up people in my entire life, end quote. At that point, I stopped the tape in my car and thought, how would I define it? What is the doctrine of the Trinity? I would say I believe in the Trinity. As it turns out, as I began studying theology and church history and everything, I had a very strong tendency toward an ancient heresy called modalistic monarchianism. You have to learn all these cool names when you're in seminary. I had to make flashcards. There are so many Christological and Trinitarian heresies, I had to make flashcards for them. 
Modalistic monarchianism, that, that's really where my tendency was and my conception of who God was. I didn't understand. I did not get that the three persons were really and eternally distinct from one another. In my mind, I thought of God as one person who took on three different roles at, at different times. And it wasn't until I read Walter Martin's book, The Kingdom of the Cults, and he goes through in great detail the doctrine of the Trinity, that I really accurately finally understood the very nature of God. Now, why is that? It was because the church I grew up in did not make use of those ancient creeds. That's why. I didn't understand it. Remember, it took battles against heresy and centuries of very difficult, very hard spade work in the text of God's word for the church to arrive at the tried and tested and proved and solid summaries of everything that's said in Scripture about the nature of God. And I'll tell you, reading Bruce Shelley and, and other historians about the, the history of these controversies, again and again and again, I, I have found myself thanking God and thank you so much for these godly people who work so hard and studied the Bible in such painstaking detail to give us these creeds. Now the creeds aren't inspired, but they're excellent summaries of all the biblical information. Archibald Alexander Hodge, one of, the, one of my favorite uh, Reformed theologian, he wrote, theologians, he wrote a great uh, commentary on the Westminster Confession of Faith, which I highly recommend as a, a worthy addition to anyone's library. I, I always have several copies of it, so if people want one, you can have it. In the introduction, Archibald Alexander Hodge has a section titled, A Short History of Creeds and Confessions. That essay is worth the price of the book. It's excellent. And he says this, quote, While, however, the scriptures are from God, the understanding of them belongs to the part of men. Men must interpret to the best of their ability each particular part of Scripture separately and then combine all that the Scriptures teach upon every subject into a consistent whole and then adjust their teachings on different subjects in mutual consistency as parts of a harmonious system. Every student of the Bible must do this and all make it obvious that they do it by the terms they use in their prayers and religious discourse whether they admit or deny the propriety of human creeds and confessions. You hear what Hodge is saying? No matter what you're going to do systematic theology, you can't avoid it. If you're a human being and you want to think consistently, logically, rationally, you are going to do systematic theology. You're either, just, you're either going to do it badly or you're going to do it well. Listen to Hodge. He says, if they refuse the assistance afforded by the statements of doctrine slowly elaborated and defined by the church, they must make out their own creed by their own unaided wisdom. Hence, I was a modalistic monarchian. A her I, the, my doctrine of God was heresy. Why? Because I was trying to do it all by myself. Listen to Hodge. The real question is not, as often pretended, between the word of God and the creed of man, but rather between the tried and proved faith of the collective body of God's people and the private judgment and the unassisted wisdom of the repudiator of creeds, end quote. There was a great issue of Modern Reformation magazine. I used to get that and, and devour it, every, every issue that came out long ago in the late 90s. And there was an issue titled, Our Debt to Heresy. Our debt to heresy. Can you think of why they would title a whole issue that? As much as we hate heresy, we hate false teaching, it's actually helped a lot. To what? Clarify the truth. Make Christians clear on what we're saying. Hodge said this, quote, Heretics spring up on all occasions who pervert the scriptures. They exaggerate certain aspects of the truth and deny others equally essential. And thus, in effect, turn the truth of God into a lie. The church is forced, therefore, on the great principle of self-preservation to form such accurate definitions of every particular doctrine misrepresented as shall include the whole truth and exclude all error, and to make such comprehensive exhibitions of the system of revealed truth as a whole that no one part shall be either unduly diminished or exaggerated, but the true proportion of the whole be preserved, end quote. Classic, classic case in point. The two natures of Christ. The two natures of Christ. Few things are clear in Scripture than that Jesus of Nazareth was a real man. And yet one of the earliest heresies, one of the earliest distortions of that was known as docetism. 
And docetism comes from the Greek verb that's actually, I had to make a flashcard for it when I took Greek, dakeo. Dakeo means I think or seem. And it was the idea, docetism was the idea that Jesus only seemed to be human. He wasn't really human, he only seemed to be human. And yet one of the major emphases in the New Testament is that he was really flesh and blood. That statement in John 1.14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus was a real human being. He slept. He got hungry. He got thirsty. He experienced joy, sadness, anger. We, we saw this morning, he bled. He bled. He died. He was a man. And we also know from the word of God that he's God. He, he gives divine titles to himself. He accepts worship. He calls himself the I am from the burning bush. In John 5, 17, the scripture says, Jesus answered them, his opponents, remember those guys, they were all upset, so upset, that the man who had been lame for 38 years was carrying his mat on the Sabbath, how dare you? He says, my father has been working until now and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Heretics would exaggerate certain aspects of the truth and deny others equally essential. Some denied Christ's full humanity and exalted his deity. Others denied his full deity and exalted his humanity. After a thorough study of all of scripture, the church was able to publish creeds to refute the various heresies, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed, and the formula of the Council of Chalcedon. Those are creeds we should all be familiar with. And that took time. It took an incredible amount of work, a credible amount of bloodshed, in some cases, persecution, sweat, and spade work in the Bible. And we owe those people a great debt of gratitude, and we would be extremely foolish to refuse to benefit from their work in the text of the Bible in the name of only going by the Bible. If you read Athanasius of Alexandria, his great book, On the Incarnation, it's one of the best books you could ever read in defense of the deity of Christ. Everything, everything that every Jehovah's Witness will ever say on someone's doorstep in this country from now until Christ comes back, Athanasius already brings it up. He'd heard it all. I remember reading on the Incarnation years ago and thinking, and then talking to a Jehovah's Witness, it's like, wow, it's, it's like being tel transported 1,700 years ago. I remember telling one of them, you realize we refuted this 1,700 years ago. The misuse of the power. The Father is greater than I, says Jesus. See, he can't be God. The Father's greater than he is. Well, yes, in the economy of salvation, yes, of course. Jesus humbled himself. God the Son humbled himself and became obedient. He humbled himself and came into this sin-cursed world. It has nothing to do with his nature. It has nothing to do with him being something other than God. But then again, we answered that 1,700 years ago already. Athanasius already refuted that from the text of Scripture. The Westminster Standards on Christ the Mediator. Perfect, wonderful, orthodox statement. Listen to this. This reflects an incredible amount of work and a credible amount of false teaching that they're refuting. 8.2. So that the whole perfect and distinct natures, the Godhead and the manhood, were inseparably joined together in one person without conversion, composition, or confusion. You know where they're getting that language? From the Council of Chalcedon, from the formula of Chalcedon in 451 A.D without conversion, composition, or confusion, which person is very God and very man, yet one Christ, the only mediator between God and man. And that represents an incredible amount of work, reflection, debate about the biblical teaching about the person of Jesus Christ. That great catechism question, in two distinct natures and one person forever. A lot of heresy, a lot of false teaching was taught about who Jesus was before it was finally understood and really hammered out, look at the biblical text, he is fully God, he is fully man, the two natures are both there, they are fully intact, you cannot mix or mingle them, the, the, the uh, formula of Chalcedon says, without conversion, composition, or confusion. The two natures are distinct, they remain distinct for eternity, because if Jesus' natures are not distinct, he can't save us. If the humanity's integrity is compromised by being mingled together with deity, then he doesn't have our nature. He can't be our substitute. You see how important this stuff is? These aren't little, these aren't things for theological eggheads to banter about. This stuff is life and death. 
That's why the Athanasian Creed, the most comprehensive statement of the Trinity, begins with the statement, he who would be saved must believe. All this stuff. And that's one of the longest creeds. If we ever recite that, you're going to be like, wow. It's going to take 10 minutes to recite it. It was our Christian forefathers' love for the Bible that led them to write out creeds and to draw up confessions of faith in the first place so that the lines could be clearly drawn in the sand so everyone would see in the face of heresy and false teaching what the Bible itself taught on those given topics. Now, here's an example of a definition from the Westminster Standards that reflects numerous historical debates. Numerous historical debates and numerous dozens of passages of Scripture. The opening section on justification, 11.1, says, Those whom God effectually calleth, he also freely justifieth, not by infusing righteousness into them. Why would they say that? Because that's what Rome said. How does God justify us? He infuses righteousness into us and thereby makes us inwardly righteous enough to get into heaven. And they say what justification is, is not by infusing righteousness into them, but rather by pardoning their sins and by accounting and accepting their persons as righteous. Not for anything wrought in them or done by them. Why why do they keep using the word not? Why do they keep saying not, not, not? Because they want to be clear and they want to tell you, here's what we're not saying. We are rejecting these false teachings. How you get into heaven? It's not because of anything wrought in us. Meaning, no work of the Spirit of God in transforming us, giving us a new heart, sanctifying us, helping us overcome sin. That has nothing to do with justification. Nothing at all. Not for anything wrought in them. And they added, or done by them. No works that I do as a Christian have any role whatsoever in my justification before God at all, but rather for Christ's sake alone, and then they add, nor by imputing faith itself, the act of believing, or any other evangelical obedience to them as their righteousness. Why did they add that? Arminianism. Remember, the Westminster Standards are written in the 1640s. When does the Synod of Dort meet? 1618 to 1619. What did the Arminians say? Well, God doesn't expect us to be perfectly righteous. Now he just accepts this lesser thing, faith, as if it is righteousness. And that's why they said he doesn't impute faith itself, the act of believing. And just to make sure anything like Arminianism ever came up, or any other evangelical obedience, they add, let's let's anticipate any other heresy, any other error anyone could ever come up with, or anything else as their righteousness, but by imputing the obedience and satisfaction of Christ unto them, they receiving and resting on him and his righteousness by faith, which faith they have not of themselves, it is the gift of God. One thing I'm thinking about is overturing the new denomination to add a few knots to our section on creation. In the space of six days, not meaning millions of years, (laughs) not as a literary framework, not that there's a whole, not a gap, not this, not that. It'd be really great to get that in there. So we could make sure that no one could possibly misunderstand what we mean, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see about that. I'd like you to turn your Bibles to a couple other passages. Look at Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 1, 6 through 9, a very, very key passage, a passage that you, know, you hear me quote a lot because it's profoundly important. <clears throat> Galatians 1, 6, here you have probably, probably one of the first times the Holy Spirit had spoken ink to paper Um, in the New Covenant era. In the sixth verse, Paul expresses his indignant wonder. He says, I marvel, I am astonished that you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Accursed. I want you to notice there how strong of a denunciation of error this is. This is not a game for the Apostle Paul. What the gospel is and how we preach it, what its content is, is a matter of eternal significance. And he says, if anyone gets this wrong, let them be damned. That term, anetithemi, where we get the word anathema in English, means let them be damned. May the fire of God's judgment fall upon that person, whether it's me or an angel from heaven. And notice the call to make sure the gospel never changes. There are those who want to pervert, who want to change the gospel of Christ. It's set in stone. The truths of Scripture and the Christian faith, they're fixed, they're unchanging as a body of truth. And that's why confessions of faith are so important, especially in the face of error. 
It's one thing to simply hand a Bible to someone and say, here's what I believe. It's much better, it's much safer and clearer when asked a specific question about a specific doctrine taught in Scripture, if you can give a succinct statement of what you believe it is the Scriptures as a whole teach about that doctrine. That's what confessions are good for. Now, continue forward there in Galatians. Look at Galatians 2.11. Galatians 2.11. Here, Paul. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, died to the law, that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Now notice here, Peter was rebuked before them all. He didn't pull him aside and do a, Matthew 18, one-on-one, you know why? Because Matthew 18 is not applicable to this. Publicly spoken false teaching has nothing to do with Matthew 18. And Peter had failed to be straightforward about the truth of the gospel by refusing to eat with Gentiles and had sinned grievously against many people in a public way by his actions. The entire book of Galatians really could be seen as an inspired confession of faith against a specific error. The denial of belief alone as the sole instrument of our justification before God. Because of its clarity and its passion, the book of Galatians emerged mightily in the 16th century Reformation as a mighty fortress against the many, many add-ons to the gospel which the Roman church had perpetrated for centuries. And Martin Luther so loved Galatians that he encouraged all Christians everywhere to memorize it in its entirety, and he even called it by his wife's name. He said, Galatians is my Katie Von Bora. It's like me saying, Galatians is my Amy Cruck. That's her maiden name. Now back to the Jerusalem Council. If you want to turn back, this will be the last passage we look at, Acts 15. Real quick here again, just want to review this, and you see doctrinal controversy, none of the apostles and the elders and none of the Christian people thought it was an attack on the Bible to get together and discuss it and to publish a creed, to publish a document defending the truth. Look at verse 1 again. Certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. There's a great principle that we're taught here. Plurality of Christian minds addressing the text of Scripture. That's a very important thing. You want to read widely. Don't just limit yourself to one guy. Don't just read read one person that you really like. Read a bunch of different people on Scripture. There's great benefit to listening to many teachers. Proverbs 11, 14. Where, where there is no counsel, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. And Proverbs 24, 6. In a multitude of counselors, there is safety. So part of the purpose of gathering was to silence and refute the false teachers. That's why they wanted to get together and discuss this. I mean, when it says there, Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension, I would love to have to seen that argument. I think Paul, Paul would have been pretty exercised about that about this. Given what he wrote in Galatians and what he wrote elsewhere about the gospel, I think that no small dissension is a, is a massive understatement. Now look at verses 3-6 through six again. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. 
And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. If we are wise, we will want to know what their conclusions were after they considered this matter. If we're wise, we will want to know. When the elders and ministers in the Netherlands, when they met to consider the teachings of the Arminian remonstrance, if we are wise, we'll want to see their conclusions. What did they say about it? I would encourage you, if you've not read the Canons of Dort, please pull it up online, read the whole document. You read the whole document. You know what those council fathers, those reformed men said about the Arminians? They said over and over and over and over again, thus they have brought out of hell the Pelagian error. Thus they have brought out of hell the Pelagian error. Thus they agree with Pelagius. Thus they agree with Pelagius. It's exactly what it was. They saw Arminianism, it was a giant step back to Rome, and they knew it. When the theologians and, and ministers in the UK gathered to draft a doctrinal statement, when the Westminster Divines, when that great group of men, recognized by nearly everyone, Presbyterian and non-Presbyterian alike, to be one of the most, if not the most learned, pious, scholarly group of Christians ever to assemble and sit in the same room in the 2,000 years behind us, should we be interested in what they had to say concerning the Christian faith after discussing it for five years? How do you like that for a session meeting? <laughs> five years. Sometimes they feel like five years. If we're, if we're wise, we will. If we're wise, we will. We'll want to learn from them. We'll want to listen to what they said. And finally, look at the last little block here, 7 to 14. When, they had, when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Now, stop there. Remember that whole narrative? Or who goes and tells Cornelius about the gospel? It's Peter. He has the vision of the sheet coming down. And Peter, true to form, argues with Jesus about it. Yeah, that's bold. Jesus tells you to do something. No, I could never, I could never be so ungodly as to do something like that. <laughs> Verse 8, so God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you test God? by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. And then verse 14, listen carefully to this. Look at how it's worded. But we believe. What is the Latin Vulgate translation of that? Credo. Credo. We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as, as they. That is the death of all forms of works righteousness. It's by grace we're saved. If we're saved by grace, it has nothing to do with works. Otherwise, grace isn't grace. Notice the clear confession. We believe, credo. This is their creed. Through the grace of the Lord Jesus, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Jew, Gentile, it doesn't matter. We're not saved by circumcision. We're not saved by dietary laws. We're not saved by obedience to the Ten Commandments. No one ever has been. Why do you want to lay this burden on them? We couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. And neither can any of you. But through the grace of the Lord Jesus, we shall be saved. So what do they do? They publish their creed. Here's what we believe. After considering this controversy, here's what we believe. What does the Apostles' Creed begin with? I believe. What does the Nicene Creed begin with? I believe. And we all say it together, I believe. And then we go through those things that we believe together. That's our creed. You can't be a Christian. In fact, you can't be a living, breathing human and not have a creed. Everybody does. About something. What do you believe about? Where we came from. If you say, I don't care, that's your creed. The closing illustration for you is the chain link fence. So this is one I've used for before. Think of a church's doctrinal statement like a chain link fence. It's intended to protect the sheep inside from predators. The more detailed and precise the church's confession of faith is, the closer together the steel threads of the chain link fence are, and thus the better protected the sheep are. And we can say inside here, inside this confession, there is safety here. This is the tried and proved faith of our Christian forefathers. The looser and more vague the church's doctrinal statement is, the wider the gaps are between the steel threads of the chain link fence. 
I mean, there was a huge secret church in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, with like 15,000 members. I remember looking at their, their church's doctrinal statement, and the section on grace said, God has love and grace for the world, and by making a decision for Christ, we tap into this stuff. thought, wow, that's precise. What in the world does that mean? Having a confession of faith that is detailed and reflective of the theological battles that have been waged and won on the basis of the text of Scripture, as well as the tried and proved exegesis of the text of Scripture from the best and the most learned and the most pious minds that God gave the church throughout history, it's like having a very strong fence with many closely knit together steel threads as part of the fence between the sheep on the inside and the wolves on the outside. Having no clear doctrine but instead holding to the notion of no creed but Christ, that's identical to having, in effect, no fence at all. We have no fence whatsoever. Every local church on this planet has doctrine. Even if they claim to have none, they still do. We either have biblical, refined, precise, and sound doctrine, or we will have unbiblical, unrefined, imprecise, and unsound doctrine. Always remember the wider the steel threads are on the chain link fence, the bigger the critters are that can get in and harm the sheep. Having a robust, well-thought-out confession of faith, like the Westminster Standards, it's like having a tightly woven, thick, and strong fence protecting all of us. And we can see from the apostolic example afforded to us in Scripture itself that standing against error and confessing the truths of God's Word against those errors, that is the example that the apostles of Christ himself give to us. So I, I would simply say to all of us, to any Christian person, let us not be fools, but wise, and stand with the many counselors and godly Christians who have gone before us, whose hard work and labors have given us a thoroughly biblical, tried and true confession, which, if we're wise enough to study and use it properly, will protect us as it protected them. And we can benefit from the collective wisdom of the greatest minds, of the greatest teachers the risen Lord has blessed his church with over the span of its whole existence through all of time. If we don't do that, we're going to reinvent every era that's ever been put forward like I did. If we benefit from them, we won't do that. Christ has been building his church. Let us remember that and let us learn from the sanctifying work that he has done to guide it more and more into all truth. Let's pray. Father, we bless your name for the examples of the passages we looked at, Galatians 1, Galatians 2, Acts 15. We see other creeds, other statements of faith really there in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 15, 1, and uh, uh, Philippians chapter 2, the Carmen Christi, and we see it in 1 Timothy, many other places. We thank you that the apostles wrote to refute errors that denied the incarnation, errors denying the deity of Christ, errors denying the sufficiency of Christ alone, by, received by faith alone for salvation. Lord, help us to have our, our noses to the wind always, to be faithful and true to the word of God and to learn from those who have gone before us and to value the great victories that Jesus has brought to his church through his church and their work. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is Amazing Grace.